Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Seper Namdar. I am from DDD Iran. Uh, we are here proud to um, having a webinar with Jan Koper, which is a polyglot uh, architect in London. Um, perhaps he will introduce himself better than me. Uh, today, we will uh, he will talk for us about TDD and uh, where did it all go wrong. Salam khidmate hame dostani ke tashrif awardan imshab. Imshab ba Jan Koper sohbat mikonim dar bare be TDD va koja az koja ye jurai zadim be hashiye. So uh, Jan uh, I will let you uh, start the talk. Uh, people can ask their questions at the end in chat. Dostan, you can ask your questions in chat. You can ask your questions in the end of the talk. You can ask your questions. Let's start. And if there are any problems with seeing me or hearing me, just give me a shout and we can, we can try and fix it. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. So this talk um, is called TDD, Where Did It All Go Wrong Seven Years After? And I'll explain why it has that title. Some of you may have seen me talk about TDD before, and this is a, a new talk, but in the, in the same vein. And I've, I've learned a lot in the years since the kind of most famous video of me talking about TDD came out. Um, whoops, slow, oh. okay. This is me. Um, it's not very exciting. It says I've been doing software development for a long time. Um, I, I do always draw my everyone's attention to the bottom part. Uh, it's very easy, I think, to believe that people who stand up and speak at conferences and events are perhaps smarter than you, and they're not. We're just the same as you. We are fortunate enough, quite often, to have been put in a place where we had the opportunity to speak. Um, but we're not better, and uh, you could do this too, right? And speak at your own local user groups and with people that you trust and know in your own local user groups, build that confidence, and that can really help you in your career because the whole notion of see one, do one, teach one is very, very valuable, and that's really what I've gained most from speaking is having to organize my thoughts and try and present them to people. Um, out of interest, I work on an open source project called Brighter. It is a framework for building CQRS style applications and that we have the ability to write a command handler. And the goal is it looks a bit like, say, in .NET and ASP.NET MVC controller. Um, uh, and so it takes messages off a wire if you wanted to, or you can just do it internally in memory. So you can either say, oh, I'm going to send something from my ASP.NET controller out to a uh, domain model to get processed or I'm going to read something off a message queue to get processed and it all looks the same from your point of view. Um, we're always welcome and open to new contributors so um, please come along and join us. We also have a Python version called Brightside if you're a Python fan and we'd love to see some more Python contributors on that. Oh, okay. My clicker is being erratic. All right, uh, what are we talking about tonight? So I, I've, I want to talk a little bit about what I see as the fallacies of TDD. And I've taken to expressing them that way as I think it's a clearer organization of some of the material that uh, was really in my prior talk more of a polemic. Um, then we'll get into this basic idea in TDD of red green refactor and we'll point out some subtleties that I don't think everyone's picking up on. Um, particularly this idea of focusing on the behavior, not the details when we're testing. Um, and we'll mention clean architecture. I do a whole full talk about clean architecture as an idea, but I want to draw in how that can be useful in a testing practice. And finally, at the end, we will talk a little bit about principles. Uh, Ken Beck raised some principles of good tests. We'll talk about those. Um, this talk, by the way, what it's not about is how to do TDD. Um, in the very basic level. So I'm not trying to, excuse my clicker, I'm not trying to um, teach you TDD tonight. 
Uh, I, I hope that you may have had at least tried it in the past. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're an ex whether you're an expert that practices it all the time or someone that tried it and gave up on it. What I want to do is challenge the approach you may have learned to TDD and give you another one. Um, so I first started talking about this topic about, about 2013. I gave a talk at NDC Oslo um, and it really built from there. And even today when I go to conferences, I will usually be approached by somebody that says, oh, hey, I really loved your TDD talk. Um, it really changed the way I and my team thought about doing uh, testing. And so it's one that I'm really well known for. But seven years later, I, when I look back on that talk, although I'm still very proud of the fact that it spoke to so many people, I felt that it, um, it is an attack on what was happening, but it doesn't really give you a more a structured way of, of thinking about TD and what's wrong with it. So I wanted to try and um, repurpose that material such that you could uh, experience it in a more organized fashion. It's still worth watching the original talk, and I don't go into in such depth in this talk the problem space, right? But I will summarize that problem space for you briefly. Um, I found in 2013, having been practicing TDD at that point for probably about 10 years, we were very early adopters in the .NET community in London, um, that I had a number of problems with the test suites that we built. The first problem was the sheer cost. We, were off, we wrote in a number of cases, three times as much test code as production code. And it was very effective in the first release. In the first release, we often shipped out production with almost zero defects, um, particularly if it was headless, it didn't have any kind of user interface. Um, it, it, could, it was a very powerful tool for producing high quality software. But we found then as we went on, that the tests that had initially helped us produce high quality software began to actually impede us. They got in our way a lot. And there's a particular case I can remember that really uh, broke me, where um, we, for various reasons, and you know that that's the expression we all have in software, right? There's this time when there were reasons. Um, we had to write our own uh, data mapping layer between our code and the database. We couldn't use an off the shelf uh, object relational mapping tool of any sort. And part of the problem was that the, the, the enterprise at that point um, was using a strategy of a shared database to integrate between applications as insurance. That was quite common. I couldn't really change it. I didn't have that kind of power at the time. Um, and because of that, the schema was completely unlike the model that we were actually using in our application. And we wanted to essentially build a data mapping tool that acted as an anti-corruption layer between us and the data so that the data just looked like what the developers would expect. So a classic example was that the database had this thing called the party model. And the party model was not to do with um, uh, you know, balloons and streamers, it was to do with uh, somebody who the system needed to know about, be that a company we dealt with, be that as an insurance system, a software broker we dealt with, be that an individual, and it even applied to users of the system. They were all parties, in the sense of parties to a transaction. But of course, in the given system we were modeling, we wanted to know about, actually this is a person or this is a broker. So we wanted a layer of abstraction over that. Yeah, and I think you should switch your, uh, your um, camera because we can't see you. Sorry. You can't see me. Yeah. Now we can see you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> no problem. Uh, let me just, I have to stop the slides to um, get access to the rest of my screen. And I'll switch the camera. Right. Excellent. I'm really sorry to interrupt you. No, no, I'm really glad you did interrupt me because um, uh, it's the problem of being a, a virtual stuff. I don't actually have what I'm presenting. I get one, one screen there that says, what's the slide there? One screen down the bottom, which is the, pre, the preview for the presenter. You seen, you are seen, you're not seeing the, the, the presenter, you are you? Yes, you're everything seeing? is fine. Excellent. Sometimes I have to switch the screen down as well. Um, 
And so we built this whole abstraction over that. And it would tell us, because we had to use stored procedures, what stored procedure you're calling, what are the parameters, and it did all the mapping for us. Um, and we essentially used a lot of mocks to build that. We mocked very heavily such that we were effectively determining what are the, all the interactions we're going to make with the database. And we said, given I do this operation, then it should result in these transactions occurring in the database. And the whole thing worked very well for the first release. And then we tried to change things. We tried to change things. What we found is that the mocks just broke. We had so many places that were essentially dependent on the way we say, for example, would the number of parameters go into a store procedure? If we wanted to add a new parameter to a store procedure, then we find 40 tests would break. We need to go through and add to all those tests what was going on. We began to realize that um, we knew too much from our tests about the implementation details of our software. And that was a big trigger for me to start thinking about how we did testing. And I went back to read Kent Beck's book. And Kent's book was a bit of a revelation to me when I read it the second time around. I read it, I read it originally, you know, probably 10 years before we started to test driven development. And it didn't feel like a great explanation of TDD. I went on to other books that I felt explained the concept much more clearly. And when I went back with the hindsight of some test driven development experience behind me, I realized Kent was incredibly insightful about the practice of TDD. And I noted that Kent, by the time he'd written this book, and publicized what they were doing at various places like the Chrysler Corporation, had been practicing TDD himself for about 10 years. And the book he wrote was essentially a, if you like, a masterclass in using this technique. It wasn't that approachable for beginners necessarily, but once you had some TDD under your belt, this really explained to you how you should use the practice. And a lot of things that I believed came from later developments that were built on top of TDD, like um, the use of patterns, use of refactoring, use of acceptance test driven development, whether that's a good idea or not, are actually in this book originally, right at the beginning of that, um, that journey. So it was quite a revelation to me. And I said before, I didn't know smart guys, everything I'm talking about is really just a re-examination of the ideas that Kent raised originally. Okay, so what do I think the fallacies of TDD are? This is the most important fallacy. And if you only take away one thing from uh, this evening's talk, this is the one you should focus on. This idea that we have that developers write unit tests. And the key word there is unit tests. What's happened is that when people talk about test-driven development, the key thing they say is, what, what are you writing? You're writing unit tests. And even Kent in casual conversation, even I occasionally in casual conversation, we use that word unit tests. And that's a really dangerous word to use. Kent himself, if you look at his book, Test Driven Development, only uses the word unit test once. And he actually uses it in this sentence to essentially say, TDD doesn't deal with unit tests. And there's an important part of what he's saying here they don't match the accepted definition of unit tests very well. So what, what is this accepted definition and why is that problematic for us? If I go and look on Wikipedia, Wikipedia would tell me that the idea behind unit tests is this idea of isolation. I have something I want to test and in order to test it, I isolate it from all of its dependencies. What I want to determine is that any failure that occurs is owned by the component under test and not owned by any of its collaborators. And as a result of that, I get this idea that I should mock all of its collaborators, right? Or perhaps a better phrase, if you know, is to use a test double. So test double is this idea of a stunt double in a movie, right? Someone that stands in for the extremely valuable actor to do dangerous work. And what we use the express test double for in testing is something that stands in for the actual collaborator. Uh, and mocks are really just a given kind of test double, but everybody uses mock a lot to, to, to meet, be synonymous to test doubles. We'll just, we'll just say mocks, right? But the idea behind a mock is to say, my class does one thing, and any other class that I interact with, I should replace it with a mock for the purposes of testing. And I get, in theory, this idea called defect localization. 
if my test fails, it fails because something inside my class is broken, not something I interact with. And this is a key idea that people who've been practicing unit testing have uh, based TDD have taken forward. And there's an idea called need-driven development. So that phrase comes from a guy called Jared Mazaros. He wrote a big book called X Unit Test Patterns. It's a huge and comprehensive volume that emerged from the TDD community in the noughties. Um, and it, it covers uh, what are the different approaches we can use to doing test-driven development. And he identified one called need-driven development. And it's most popular from a book called Growing Object-Oriented Software with Tests. And the idea we say is, I'm going to try and implement my class that, has, that does something for me. Let's say, for example, it, calcula it calculates your insurance premium. Um, and during the implementation of that class, I realize that there's a thing outside the responsibility of my class. For example, perhaps it's something to do with calling an actuarial system, etc. that I need to, I need to um, put in a separate class. And then what I do is I say, well, I will create an interface with nothing in it initially that is a dependency for this class. And then I will add the methods that I would want to call on that other class into that interface. And then in my test, I'll create a mock and the mock will implement this interface for me. I as yet have no implementation of that particular um, class. Right? I finished writing this test. I know that this test calls that other class. And then I go away and I write the other class according to the specification of that interface that I developed in that work. And this is very heavily dependent on us being able to use mocking as a tool. And what happens is when we look at our test, our test says, I'm going to tell you what the internals of this class are doing. I am going to give you observability of that. So this class is going to calculate something, oh, it's going to call this collaborator and this collaborator and this collaborator. And you know what? If I have to get values back from those, I can mock those values, which help me drive this test through from end to end. Okay. And that style, sometimes called the London School of Test Driven Development, became quite popular. Uh, and that had other consequences. So if you live in, particularly, say, Java or .NET land, you'll know that nowadays because you tend people tend to write their code in this style with injecting all the dependencies and mocking them out of the class it means that actually nearly all my classes have dependencies some of which are actually only used for tests but some of which are used then in production and that creates this web of dependencies i want to instantiate that class that class in turn has a dependency that i need to instantiate has another dependency and so on and that, that graph can be quite hard for us to figure out by hand. And so we create basically inversion of control containers. And we say this inversion of control container will help us to actually realize that graph at runtime. So you can just register everything, tell it what your dependencies are, and it will go and figure out what those dependencies are for you. Right? And that is a consequence, those inversion of control containers, really of the growth of this strategy of mocking out my dependencies when we're trying to build software by this needs-driven development approach. Just review that sentence. And even back in 2007, I, I'd begun to realize, I think, that this was a huge problem. And it was a problem because it made the tests very fragile. And it made the tests very fragile for two reasons. The first was this thing called behavior sensitivity. And the second was overspecified software. Now, behavior sensitivity is an awkward word here. Nowadays, we might say structure sensitivity. Um, but I, what happened is that when I changed any of my collaborators, I wanted to change their API in some way, that rippled out to every single consumer of that collaborator. And that was where I would get the situation where I would go into my I database interface in, my, in the other example I gave you, change some of the parameters that were effectively going to my store procedure and see a sea of red. So I became very sensitive to the changes in the other, other systems, even if what I really cared about was just the data it gave back to me. And people tried to move away from this. They said, 
um, well, you know, let's not check exactly what the method is that I'm calling and the parameters passing to it. Let's just say that that thing's going to give me the result back that I care about moving on and I won't check, I won't verify I called that. That, in a sense, was helped. But I be, you begin to question, well, why then, if we're not checking that I call this other interface, which has this given uh, signature, why have I used this approach in the first place then of, of defining that interface as a process of developing the implementation of this class and defining its collaborators? And also, by the way, the other problem with that approach is there's a whole question of, well, which collaborators instantiate which things, and you get this whole drift between top down saying, at the big, I will try and generate the first class that you see in the sequence. It will generate all its collaborators, which will generate all their collaborators. But you can get in quite a web of who actually writes the first test that implements a given collaborator, because you may end up being a collaborator for somebody else. They've already defined your interface, right? But it also leads to overspecified software. And overspecified software is this notion that my um, I know too much in my tests about the implementation details of the code, right? even in the class under test. So not, it's not that I know about behavior interviews, I know about my collaborators' interfaces. And overspecified software is I know exactly how you've implemented it. I know that you've implemented it by calling this collaborator. And I know that you call this collaborator, these methods on that collaborator. And I know that essentially you pass it these values. And that's quite a lot for me as a test to know, because it means if you change that, my test has to change too. So these tests are very fragile. And Ken Beck said only last year, I'm um, really talking about this issue, right? Tests should be coupled to the behavior of the code and decoupled from the structure of the code. I'm seeing tests that fail on both counts. And this notion of the structure of the code is what Mazzara calls behavior sensitivity. It's a little bit confusing because Kent's using behavior to mean something else um, than, than Gerard is. So from Gerard's criticism, it's the structure of the code here. So he's saying, in my test, I know a lot about how the implementation is structured. I know you're gonna call this and pass it these values, right? What I really care about is what requirement are you implementing with that code? I don't really care about how you've chosen to implement that requirement. I care that you're implementing a given requirement. And the big place this shows up for us mostly is in refactoring. Now, like a lot of engineering terms, we drift their meaning over the years. But when uh, Kent Beck used the word refactoring in terms of red green refactor, when Martin Fowler wrote his large book about refactoring based upon his cataloging of the smells and patterns that he'd seen working with Kent at places like Chrysler Corporation, um, it was very clear that essentially if I refactor, none of my tests should need to change. When I refactor, I'm changing implementation details. My tests point to the public interface of my module. So I'm going to use the word module rather than a class because um, tests are really focused on a module more than anything else. And a class can be a module, right? But we're focused on a module. And what I'm saying is, um, hey, that public behavior is my contract with the outside world. That's the thing that's going to implement the part of the requirement that I have responsibility for. But the way that I have implemented that requirement, my internal details, is no business of anybody else's. And if we go back to, you know, um, uh, David Parnas writing in the 1970s on the decomposition of software into modules, we talk about layers, modules, all those principles that were trying to get us to have loosely coupled, highly cohesive software, because that's easy to change. A key idea is we hide the implementation details. And in fact, that's all object orientation is really supposed to be doing, right? Saying here is the public interface that you call, all the implementation details are hidden from you. You don't really know about how my state, about my method implementations or what I'm doing, I'm hiding that from you. 
And one way that's done to make it easy for you to reason about things. You don't need to know the implementation details to use me, but it's also designed to effectively make it easier to change. You have no dependencies on those details, so therefore we can change them. And I should be able to change the way that I implement a class without affecting its requirement. If I have something that says naively, I'm going to calculate the insurance premium that you should pay us for your car insurance based on the factors you have set up as state for me, then if I come up with a different algorithm for calculating that premium, the consumers of my module shouldn't care, right? All they care about is I ask you for the premium, you tell me the premium. They don't care what algorithm you use to calculate that premium. It's unimportant to them. and You want to be able to change it. The same applies to, I don't know, I have a data structure which stores um, 200 values. And today I'm implementing it as an array. And then someone comes along and says, we need to store 5,000 be able to insert um, in, in, uh, basically in the, in the middle of it. What data structure are you going to use? Someone says we've got 20,000, right? In theory, those choices should be ones that are hidden because they're not relevant to the consumer of my API. And the problem with approaches that effectively work by unit tests that demand that we, are, we make our collaborators something that we mock and therefore understand the internal operations we're performing is that they don't allow us quite often to change those implementation details because quite often we, we bang straight up against a mock that's told us how we're talking to something else. So Ken um, talked about this in a video that you can see, I think this is the, the video link where, so about 2014, about a year after I, I spoke at NDC Oslo, um, uh, DHH, the creator of Ruby on Rails, um, came out, you know, with a rant about similar, similarly rant about failures of testing. Um, and uh, Marlon Fowler created, had a little sort of meeting of mind meeting between Kent Beck and DHH. And Kent, you know, mentioned in that discussion, right? He said, "I don't go very far down the mock path. Your test ends up coupled to the implementation, not the interface." Right? And that is a big problem with the unit testing strategy. You don't want to couple to the implementation or to couple to the interface. And this has been really known for quite some time. So early on, the XP community on the C2 wiki said quite clearly, hey, the better name for these things is a programmer test or a developer test. Programmer test, I think, is the preferred of two choices. And they were pretty clear. There's a discussion on that wiki that says they're not unit tests. Why are they not unit tests? Because in a unit test, your goal is that failure of that test implicates one and only one unit or whatever your unit is, method, class, module, package. When we're doing programmer testing for our test first approach, all we know is that the failure of that test means that the last edit we made to our software was bad. Well, we have two choices at that point. We either know enough to reason about why that change was bad and fix it, or we revert it and try again. But programmer testing is not unit testing. In a test first strategy, we add some new behavior, some existing tests go bad, we can either revert or fix, but we know where we are. We're not looking for that kind of unit testing, only one thing will explode. We just know, we know that the defect is the code we just added. And one of the things we should be doing is working in small tight cycles with TDD, such that probably we only added at most 20 lines of code in the last change. So it's easy for us to throw away if we want to say, that didn't work, let's start again. Or essentially it's um, easy for us to look at and debug and even that using the debugger and say, ah, you know, that's what's gonna co been cause of the problem but certainly it'll be that most recent bit of code, which should be a small number of lines of code to check. And so this, this adage is essentially what even then the C2 people were talking about, is that test-driven development produces developer tests. A failure implicates the most recent edit. You don't need to use mock object objects to fit up in testable units, and you can avoid debugging by simply reverting the last edit. And actually, it turns out if you start following this practice, your tests change for the better. 
because you start to move back and think to yourself, right, well, I can just new up an object. Sure, great. I can keep that implementation detail out of the way. I can change it more easily. My tests look clean then because suddenly all that code that I had to set up that was really just provisioning my mocks and the expectations and checking the assertions on the results are much more state-based. They say, I call this operation, I should get this result. There is a slight caveat here, and it's one more return to my talk to clean architecture. There is essentially one place where we want to avoid um, uh, problems that may lead to us using a test tuple, and that's that we need to better run test suites that run all of our tests potentially in parallel for speed. Because I really want that fast feedback loop with TDD. I want there to be seconds between me having finished making a change, hitting my test suite, and then getting a response back that tells me in a binary way, did I fail, did I succeed, and tells me whether I can move on or whether I need to either debug or revert. Right? And to do that, I have to be fast. And the problem with some things is that they're not fast and they can't be run together. So if I had a database and I was writing rows basically from one test and I was doing calculations against the rows in another test, it might be that the rows I was writing in the first test keep changing the result that the second test sees. And as a result, those two tests have an interaction, which means one of my tests becomes fragile. Similarly, if I'm talking across a network to a payment gateway to get a response back, that's going to be slow and my tests won't run very fast. So where essentially things tend to be slow or it's not easy for me to um, uh, create, avoid the problem of tests in test interaction against a shared resource, meaning my tests become fragile, then it may be appropriate to use a test double. I tend to think about this as anywhere that does IO I may be suspicious that I may want to replace that test time with something that's cheaper and easier for me to basically use for testing purposes. Now that comes with a risk. And the risk is that um, if, if my tests aren't exercising the real thing, how do I know that there's not some hidden problem as a result of what I'll see when I exercise the real thing? We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, you can set it up so your test suite could swap out um, between an in-memory version and the real version, and you run the in-memory version for most of your keep moving TDD cycle, but then you can swap out to a real version for what does that actually work. But we will we'll come back to that again a bit later. Um, so these are the things I would tend to basically restrict mocks to being. I need to isolate this test from other tests. So one of the things that uh, um, typical there are file systems, databases, uh, fast, I'm doing IO, it's too slow. I need to speed something up by talking to it, by replacing it with a test double. Um, and something that's fragile, something that will break if I don't um, replace the test double. So my, can, my usual example there is time. Let's say, for example, that I timestamp something and I want to check the timestamp that was applied was the same one that was, say, um, roughly the, the time window something being sent in, etc. Quite often, a way to do that is to have a clock object um, that when my code, I ask the clock to give me a time and I can replace that at runtime with a, with a test double that just gives me whatever time I put in and say, okay, you should expect to receive this time. Now I can assert that the time you have on the stamp is the time that I expect, right? You asked the clock and got a time. I'm still doing state-based testing usually. I'm testing the results of that. I don't want to test the interaction with the clock. And similarly with fast and isolated tests, I don't want to check your interactions I want something that's usually a fake or a stub that will simply help me avoid using that thing. But I still don't tend to te test the interactions at this point. Did you call X with these parameters? I don't do that. I just say, hey, you know what? I should better test by the state change that you made. You called it, I'm just replacing it for purpose of speed or avoidance of basically interacting tests. All right, so that was developers write unit test. That's our first fallacy. The second fallacy I want to talk about is that this idea that customers write acceptance tests. And the problem here is to do with suites written in things like um, the Gherkin syntax, 
uh, cucumber, etc., um, or things written in fit or fitness, where we have these tools, the promise of which is that you will write a test in a domain specific language or essentially a table and the customer will effectively be the one writing these tests, which you will then automate to drive your software to prove that your software works. And the idea would be I can, as a customer, can review all the rules which are contained within the, in the DSL that you've written. I can review them all, see that they're all green and say, ah, oh, yes, the behaviors I expect in the system, they are being successfully implemented. And I can tell that because it's green and I can read through what they are, these executable specifications. And there's a slight problem with those tools. Um, the first is that um, this idea says uh, the key part of this is the customer is writing the tests. There's nothing wrong with the idea of the customer writing the acceptance criteria. And indeed, when we talk in Agile about a user story, one of the key ideas is that the user story is a promise for conversation with the customer. One of the other problems I see out there today is um, what people don't uh, understand enough of is the team should sit down when they get that user story off the backlog and say, now we have work to do. Now we have to talk to the customer to find what the acceptance criteria are. Given the acceptance criteria, we now need to do design. Okay. We need to do design to figure out how we're going to implement this. Then we'll start writing some code at what's, put, what's usually referred to as the last responsible moment, right? Where essentially, now the best, best thing to do is to get feedback on that conversation we've had about how to build it is to write code and see it work. Okay. Nothing wrong with the customers being involved in that process for specifying, but there's this idea that they would actually write that themselves. And James Shaw, who's one of the creators of FIT, which is one of the tools in this family, said there's a real problem. That's the customers don't participate and they create significant maintenance burden. So customers don't participate, what we mean is they don't write the tests. And I've struggled to really find anywhere where the customers can genuinely sit down and write the tests into the tool. A customer is perfectly okay with writing acceptance criteria and sticking in a markdown file and saying, here are the acceptance criteria of this story, and we can look at that. But a member of the team usually has to transfer that into the tool. They're just not interested in participating using the tool. They don't tend to want to check the tool ever. They never really want to seem to go and actually say, yeah, you know what I'll do this afternoon? I'll review what the tests we've got encoded in the tool and make sure that our software works as expected. That never seems to happen. And then the other problem is that essentially these tests are, are read at the beginning of the iteration. Here are all the things we're going, here's the story we're going to build. Here's the test for that story. It's read because I haven't implemented that story. Off we go and start writing unit tests in order to go and implement the story. And the problem with that is because the tests are read for a period of time, as a developer, I ignore the fact that the tests are read on our functional test suite because it's probably because we haven't implemented those yet. Right? But in fact, that could be breaking because we actually failed to satisfy the acceptance criteria for this or for a story we've already implemented. But because I just kind of ignore it and because my CI system is trying to ignore red tests, particularly something I'm implementing already, I ignore that. So every time I've done this, what tends to happen is towards the end of the iteration, we had to have this crazy day where we try and make the tests in the functional test suite pass. And quite often it's a problem with the functional test suite itself, right? The way that we built stuff or a problem has emerged through it. And the unit tests are shut service to hold things green. The red test, we have to fix up the test suite itself usually. And there's quite a burden for the developer. I have to switch mindsets now to how does this um, DSL based tool work? How does it translate expressions in the natural languages parsing into calls into my code? So it's quite a heavy price for a tool that's not being used by the customer. So James Shaw said, you know, there's no point to these tools if the customer is not actually using it. If the customer is not sitting down writing the tests, why are we doing that? Far better to simply have the customers create some examples when they're sitting down with us when we elaborate the story and write and put them down in a mark, markdown file and us taking those examples and using them to write our programmer tests because we're going to do TDD by writing programmer tests. And the problem I think stems from this issue of unit tests. If I develop with the unit tests, 
what I have is a vaguely unsatisfying meal at the end of it. I've eaten, but I still feel hungry. And the problem is that I don't really know if my software works. I've got individually tested units, but until I assemble them all together and replace the mocks with actual concrete implementations, I tend to sit there going, hmm, I wonder if it actually works. I wonder if when this component and this component and this component collaborate, I actually get software that works the way I expect. And particularly if what you're doing in the test is quite often hypothesizing how the mocks that you're essentially building up will be used by the, by the code that you're now implementing, you can get this horrible situation where you predict how the behavior should work, you implement that, that's what the tests tell you, and then you come to actually integrate things and discover that's a nonsense. And so both integration tests and acceptance tests seem to be driven by the fact that we built units. If we would like developer tests and we just say, what am I implementing? Oh yeah, here's some acceptance criteria with some examples that the customer wrote. I'm implementing that and making that acceptance criteria passed. Given that I have these inputs, I should get these outputs. And they're focused at a customer level or a technical detail level, right? The other problem we tend to get in an agile practice is we say, oh, what am I doing next on this story? I'm implementing this class, right? You're not. You're implementing this requirement from the customer, which is expressed in these acceptance criteria. What's the next step I'm taking to help implement that? And so a lot of the house of cards has been built upon this idea of unit testing. And if we throw away unit testing, we don't need half the rest of the stuff IOC containers, we don't need um, uh, behavior driven development style, um, Cucumber or fit based tools. We just write developer tests. The other thing is that we want to be able to read our test suite. I don't know about you, but working in a unit test style, particularly heavy mocking, I'd often come back and look at a test and go, I don't really understand my test. Um, there's a lot going on here. It doesn't really make any sense to me what's happening here. I can't really see what the requirement is. I just see um, a method being called and a whole lot of stuff being mocked. And even if I work with a test suite, it lets me lift out a lot of those dependencies. I still find it quite hard to evidently see what requirement I'm checking. I just know that there's a method call here and it's been passed some parameters. Quite what it does in the big picture of things I'm not sure about, and that means when it fails, it's really hard for me to determine did it fail because the requirements have changed or because this thing essentially has, is broken in some way that really is important to me. And I, and I find it hard to understand what role does this class play in satisfying customer requirements? I've got a test around it, but what is it doing? Right. And if I work back to a model that says I'm expressing a requirement in my test, I'm expressing that against a public interface. Then my tests say, hey, start here. Start here because I'm gonna tell you that this requirement, which comes from the customer, is fulfilled by calling this API in the module. And you know what? I can now drill down into the code that's under test and say, great, now I know that all the things in here are implementation details of that requirement. Much easier. So TDD, essentially it needs to be the thing that's focused on the acceptance criteria for the stories. And the problem with introducing ATDD is you're saying that something else contains the acceptance criteria for the story and that TDD is some micro portion of that. And if you throw away ATDD and just say, actually, I'll just do that with my unit, that's what my unit testing tools were for in the first place, you'll have much more success. So there's a kind of thing that follows on from this, and this is this idea that a trigger for a test is a new function. And often when I used to you know, do this classical unit testing based TDD practice, what I'd be saying is, I need to write a method on a class. Okay, that's some test to test that method. Okay, I need another method, maybe that's prompted by um, something in this particular method needs to call another method to get its work done, great. Uh, but a method, that's what's going to trigger the right test. And you get people asking this question all the time on sites like Stack Overflow. How do I, how do I test my uh, private methods on my class? 
And someone then always comes up with a hack or a solution, like for example, in .NET, assembly is visible, uh, internal is visible to you, right? And you want to say, well, step, whoa, step back. Why does your test need to understand your internals? They're the things you want to change. But it's, and the person says, oh, well, that's because this method, I'm doing it method by method. I need to basically test what this method does. Right? Don't do that. Right? Your test is based on a requirement. Your tests the things that are coupled to the requirements. So the requirement, a new requirement, another requirement to implement is what drives the test or another facet of an existing requirement, right? The customer's written four different acceptance criteria for you for that part of the requirement. Probably that's about four tests that you need to implement to drive your software, okay? So as soon as I basically get into this model of that, and I say, well, that's what's driving the thing under the test. That's what's coupled to the tests. Right, not nothing, not just not a specific, not a specific class or not a method on that class. So this is an example that Kent has as his book of something you want to TDD. Right, there is nothing. There's no nothing in Kent's book which says now we're going to test the add currency method, the add method on my currency object. Right, what he says is I need to be able to add amounts in two different currencies and convert the results given a set of exchange rates. Right, it is essentially what we nowadays phrase is a given when then requirement, right? Given that I have um, two amounts in different currencies uh, and an exchange, an exchange rate, when I add them, I will get a total in uh, the first currency's exchange rate, right? Uh, for, for, for the first amount's currency, rather. And that's what you're implementing in TDD, okay? That's what you want. I want to better see from the test. So I want to better go into the test and read your test, and I can determine that's what you were testing. And so every you just write a test to take the next most obvious step towards implementing that story. Okay. So I think this is relevant to what uh, Dan North basically spoke about um, originally back in the early two thousands when he. Uh, create, ex expressed it as this. Um, he thought he stopped wanting to talk about tests. He said, I want to start talking about behavior. And he started to call TDD behavior driven development. And what he meant by that is um, forget about testing. You're not doing testing, unit testing, integration testing, system testing. What you're doing is exploring how you would implement these behaviors. Now, I'm not here advocating BDD. Uh, BDD is an entirely new thing now and includes things like acceptance test driven development in its model. What I'm advocating is Kent Beck style test driven development. But Dan's observation was true. That potentially the word test is a billion dollar mistake in the whole practice because um, it encourages people to go this line of, oh, a unit test. Oh, that's isolation from other um, uh, collaborators. Oh, an integration test to pull them all together, right? It led to that whole problem occurring. And that maybe if Kent Beck had originally called it behavior driven development, we'd be in a very different place today. The other fallacy I see out there is this idea people tend to promote saying it doesn't matter if you test first or you test last. And I think actually this may be even in um, Accelerate. I think Accelerate may have this, you know, Accelerate the great Bible of um, we've, we, we, we've proved everything with data, you can trust us. Uh, and Accelerate says, it doesn't matter if you test first or test last. And people have this as kind of a mantra, right? And the reality is that is true if all you think your test suite for is to basically provide uh, quality uh, for the software in terms of regression. But I put it to you that that isn't what test-driven development is designed to give you. There are a couple of things that TDD gives you that you won't get if you test after. Design and scope control. Let's do scope control first, that's the easiest. If we move to a model of developer tests where we are only writing code in response to a requirement given to us by a customer, then we don't have speculative code which can create defects because it's not actually a run in production, so we don't observe it. When someone turns it on, it goes bang. And we don't write code that the customer didn't pay us to write because ultimately software is an economic proposition, right? 
someone's paying money and they want to get a return value from their money. And they, they want stuff to pay us to write the software they need, not software we, we speculate they might need in two years time, which is we know we're probably like to be very incorrect on what they actually needed. And so by doing tests first, I say, just implement this scope. If I do test last, I've already implemented the excess scope. And even if I throw it away, the test have provided no mechanism for scope control for me. Second thing is that test first does design. It says, I have a requirement. That requirement is to add two amounts in different currencies and get a result in one currency. I should be able to add these two amounts in two different currencies together and express it in another currency, especially in a third currency. What would be a good API on my module to let somebody do that? And your test, by expressing it in a clear way, hey, I know what I should do. I need to express somehow how that works in a way that someone reading it go, I can see what they're doing. They're adding two different amounts in two different... Uh, with different currencies and getting a result in a third currency, it's obvious what this API does to me, great. Right. That design aspect is lost. Nothing forces that design for you in a, in a method that does test last. So what I do, I, I do a workshop based on this talk now. One of the things I show you there is when you do basically test uh, last, quite often you think in your head about what are the classes I'm going to need, right, beforehand. You say, oh, well, I'm probably going to need a exchange rate class and I'm probably going to so you, you speculate on what your design is and you go and assemble all of those individual classes and then try tying them together integration tests right oh and you, and you test afterwards to say yeah great they were all there what test driven development does is it says maybe you don't need any of those classes maybe you're making a solution to the problem far more complicated than it actually needs to be why don't we find out together right. there's a book I recommend um 99 bottles of oop which talks a lot about this notion of premature complexity in the refactoring step. And most of what Dante Brooks and Uber is about is about the refactoring step. When we, when we do test-driven development, we're telling ourselves the story of how the operation will look from the outside. We're saying, I'm going to define this API, and I'm going to see that that API is good. And often, TDD gives you an interesting bit of feedback when you work in the developer test style. Because one of the things you may say is, I don't know what test to write next. And usually the reason you don't know what test to write next is because you don't have acceptance criteria from the customer to implement. Because maybe the way you practice Agile is you have a user story and you don't really reach out to the customer until you're a bit stuck later on and go, what's it supposed to do? Right. And the reality is, it should force you to say, oh, I can't really write any tests yet. I don't have any acceptance criteria. So how can I write the test? I don't know what the test is supposed to express, right? So it forces you back to the customer to say, can you give me the acceptance criteria, right? Hey, I'm about to write this test because I figured out that I, I needed to think about this case. What is the acceptance criteria for that case? Can you tell me? The other thing that may be helpful is for many people, psychologically, there's an immense benefit to test first, which is I, you can look at the problem of designing a solution to something and feel overwhelmed. There are so many things to think about, so many possibilities, right? And TDD narrows it down a lot for you. It just says, focus on implementing a requirement. Don't worry about making the quality of the software good. Focus on implementing the requirement. Then you can focus on making it good afterwards. And it helps a lot of people through that paralysis. I, I suffer from adult ADHD, and it really helps me focus on just get another 20 minutes of work done. Just get another 20 minutes of work done. Get that dopamine hit, move on. Right? Really helpful. Um, there's this idea that you want 100% test coverage of code. This folks around a lot. This is a terrible fallacy. Don't do that. Um, uh, if we're testing first in, the, in this uh, our strategy, we shouldn't be writing perspective code anyway. Right? So all the code that we write should be essentially under test because our test was driving it. It didn't exist. We haven't put it in there. We didn't have a test which was driving its existence. And what we're really doing we're quite often with coverage tools is to, is to make sure that the code we implement in response to that doesn't have uh, untested paths, right? Hey, I was bad. I went in and added that if statement because I thought, oh, you know, uh, maybe I should check for that and I don't go and write a test 
that basically checks for that requirement. So coverage is a lot about checking I was honest, right? When I've written my latest test, I've checked that it's gone green in its past, and I run my coverage. Did I, in, did I introduce something new that isn't tested? And what I care about is what was the percentage of coverage before? What is the percentage of coverage after? Have I dropped coverage? If I've dropped coverage, I've introduced untested parts. Why? Maybe it's fine. Maybe there's a really good reason why that happened, but we understand, we document that maybe somewhere and we move on. Next time somebody run, comes to do something, they run the test suite, bef cover suite beforehand and say, okay, what's the coverage before I start working? What's the coverage after I start working? Have I worsened it? You don't care if it's 100%, you just care you didn't worsen it. Right? And we're, if, we're, if we're using a proper refactoring strategy, we're not rewriting, we're making safe moves that each time move us towards the goal of having something new. The other thing to bear in mind is that in the strategy we're talking about, developer tests, and we're saying actually there are some things that are hard to get under test for us because they create shared fixture or speed problems. We may not even choose to test drive those. Right? We may say, you know what? I need to implement a database, uh, based on, which implements this interface that I defined as being the interface to my database because it's a shared fixture problem. Great. Um, what am I discovering by doing TDD now? I know what the interface looks like. I can read the documentation for the database. Yeah, I can probably just go ahead and implement that. There's no discover involved, okay? It just is literally, I just go and implement it. But hey, maybe I want to automate that. Maybe I want to cover that for regression. Or oh, I could probably use my X unit based test tools to automate that. But I'm doing test automation, not test driven development. I'm saying there's an area of my code that I want to automate. I'm going to do that. Now, I would probably not tend to call that nowadays an integration test, right? Um, people tend to use that phrase integration test for that. I would just call it test automation because integration test implies I've got a unit somewhere else and we get in that whole bad world again, right? So I'd say there's a developer test and there's test which is TDD is producing in a test first style and there's some automation testing I'm doing to cover other areas kept against regression. Okay, some tips. Don't draw test drive visual output, right? You're not trying to discover what the screen looks like. You've got that hopefully off a UX designer, or if you haven't got that off a UX designer, hope that you're a better visual designer than I am because I'm awful. Right? But you're, the screen looks a certain way as wireframe. You're not trying to define how the screen looks. The screen's hooked up to things that tend to be based on events that are described when you press this button, this thing happened. You're not trying to discover that. You're trying to implement how it works. You may want to automate the testing of that, for regression, but you're not test driving it. Um, if you have a spike or the throwaway code, don't use TDD, right? What you're trying to do in that spike is something like, I don't know how um, the PayPal uh, API works. I can't really estimate the story and determine how long it would take to do it. Let me spend a day spiking at the PayPal API and then I'll come back to you and give you a number. That code gets thrown away. It's not production code. There's no point in writing tests to do it. I know some folks like the idea of doing TDD to um, explore an API, and if that works for you, fine. If a REPL works for you, fine. But you're not really doing test-driven development, right? It's not, it's not, I'm not we're saying you should do that practice, it's just that you prefer that as a developer, fine. Go for your life. Use a REPL, go for your life, right? But it's not, our TDD practice shouldn't focus on those things. Don't test-drive integration that we just talked about, right? Automate it by all means. If what I'm doing is checking that I can talk to a Dynamo data table when I go to implement my uh, data access object, then just do it, okay? And third-party code, same problem. Just interface with it and automate it if you need to. All right. Um, yeah, TDD is what we call fast binary feedback. Okay, hang on a minute. Oh, I missed a... Right, okay. Oh. TDD is what we call fast binary feedback. It's binary, and essentially the outcome is red or green. You succeeded or you failed, right? And it's fast in the sense that I don't want to interrupt my flow, so I need to get quick feedback. I also work in a quick style, right? 
What's the next bit of the requirement? Great. Can I get through that in 20 minutes or so and try and have a passing test? Okay, what's the next chunk of the requirement? I can do in sort of 20 minutes or so, right? Keeps my attention focused, means that I'm not writing so much code that it's hard to debug. Because remember, in my style of testing, then I know that the last edit is the thing that would have caused a problem. So if I get red tests, I either need to be able to quickly understand my code and effectively fix it, or be able to revert it. So I don't want too large a chunk of code at any one time. So it should be fast and binary, right? When developing short cycles. And if the feedback's not quick, we need another way to confirm, right? So in other words, if basically put, adding it to a database, reading the file system, talking over the network slows us down, use the test double instead, right? Because I want that faster feedback. TD is sufficient. This is the other fallacy, but I think you probably got the hint on this one, right? This is the classic test pyramid. Um, uh, not test pyramid, the ice cream cone. This is the bad old world, right? Where essentially we did all of our work in manual tests and then automatic human integration in unit tests. We don't want to go back to that absolutely for, for, for certain, right? We do want to have a test pyramid where essentially the bulk of our work comes eventually in developer tests. But there are other things we may need there, right? So automated tests, we just talked about that around IO, uh, maybe some end-to-end -end testing of our API, maybe some testing of our UI of our basically something like Selenium, right? Monitoring and alerting. Monitoring and alerting is exceptionally valuable to give us basically a way of proving our code works in production. People worry about, I've done TDD, but I didn't test my database integration. Well, you could probably do it with IO, but maybe actually you feel comfortable enough about releasing to a small percentage of basically your nodes in production, seeing if it fails, right? Maybe you don't need to go to all the expense of automating. The developers probably done some basic fundamental testing when they before they before they declare it down to ship it. Maybe if all we're worried about is regression, maybe we're happy we'll pick that up in monitoring and alerting, right? And then some manual tests, but they're really about exploratory testing. In other words, trying to use the systems in ways we didn't expect and see what breaks. And essentially, the the distance the difference is how long the feedback loop is and how fragile the test is. And we want more tests that are not fragile and have short feedback and less tests that are fragile and have long feedback times. All right, let's summarize the fallacies. Developers write unit tests. No, you write developer tests. Customers write acceptance tests. No, developers are informed about the developer tests that they write from acceptance criteria provided by the customers. The trigger for a new test is a new function. No, the trigger for a new test is the next part of the requirement is defined by the customer's acceptance criteria. It doesn't matter if you test first or test last. No, you test first because then you get scope control and you get design. Uh, you can choose to test to automate things that don't fall nicely into TDD. You want 100% test coverage of your code? No. You just want to use coverage to make sure that you don't have untested paths in your code, following you adding some more code to implement a new requirement, or more importantly, sometimes doing a refactoring. I do a refactoring, have I introduced paths that are untested? Okay. And TDD is sufficient. No, TDD is part of an overall quality strategy towards your code. And one of the things you need to think about is what is it good for? What's its place? Its place is great for driving your model. Um, for, for driving the testing of domain model, it's less good for things like UI, database access, that kind of thing. Use the tool for what it's good for. Okay, let's talk about Red Room Refactor. I'm going to pause for a moment while I drink some water. This is a newish talk for me, so I'm never quite sure how I'm doing for time. So I could be keeping you forever. Oh, disastrously bad. Okay, so Red Room Refactor. Um, that's just the classic TDD cycle. We only have a few things to say about it, just to help you. Um, to refresh your memory of the cycle, read, we run a test that essentially doesn't work, doesn't potentially doesn't even compile. Tests are read because we need to basically be able to test tests. So I need to, I need to understand this thing. It wouldn't just be green, whatever I did, right? And that's happened to me in the past. Occasionally I've written something and it was green and like I've written no code. How can it be green, right? The test wasn't, wasn't right. Green. Uh, get the test to pass as quickly as possible, committing whatever sins are necessary in the process. And that's really important, right? 
the most important thing I'm doing here now is attempting to solve the problem of the requirement. And I don't want to necessarily worry about design. So I would just essentially say, whatever the API method is that I'm calling, usually a huge transaction script of line after line of code is ideal, right? I'm trying to figure out what the algorithm is that I need to implement, especially if that algorithm is emerging over a number of tests. I don't want to prematurely improve that design. I want to wait until I know what the algorithm is going to be. And then refactor. And originally for Kent, that was about limiting duplication uh, and a duplication of knowledge, not duplication just of a line of code, right? The two, two parts of my uh, implementation know how to do the same thing. Um, but also you can go to say Martin Fowler's uh, refactoring book for code smells. I'd also recommend um, 99 bottles of OOP uh, on refactoring steps, All right? Now the summary is you write a test, make it compile, run see that it fails, make it run and reduplication, All right? When we're in the make it run step, this, this kind of green step, one of the things to bear in mind, there's this idea that we should really be going as fast as possible and write terrible code, right? Um, what you should be saying to your friends is almost the, the, the reverse of what you might think. When, you, when they're in the, in the green step and they're trying to basically get the, the test to go from red to green, you should say to them, did you cut and paste that code from Stack Overflow? And if they say, no, of course not, we should say, why not? You should have cut and pasted that code from Stack Overflow, right? Because at that point, you should be doing the cheapest possible thing you can do to get that working. And even if it looks atrocious right now, I want it to pass because I'm working through a series of tests on exploring the algorithm that I need and the data structures that I need to implement that test. And that's why we explicitly say write simple code. Do all the things that you think are bad, right? Because you don't want to try and do both make it good and make it pass at the same time, right? These are two separate things we want to do. To make it pass, make it, and then we'll make it good. All right. So the refactoring step is where we make our code look nice. And if you've been finding yourself just writing great implementations every time on the green step, just step back a bit and think to yourself, hey, maybe I should wait until I understand the complete picture of all the tests of exactly what I'm doing, because maybe I may prematurely go in the wrong direction. And then it's really hard to persuade myself to revert all those changes are made and actually start again. Um, so for Ken, originally it's where we remove duplication. For mine, it's where basically we deal with code smells. And for Joshua Karayevsky, it's where basically we implement, we apply patterns. So software design patterns, you know, a great boom to us. It's a way of sharing knowledge about how to solve specific problems. But we had this problem we call being pan happy, the idea that I keep looking for ways to places to apply that pattern where it's inappropriate. And the context of those patterns became very, so people would to say, hey, is the context for this pattern correct that you're using it? And a nice thing about this model is I can just get through the green step and say, that's what a solution looks like. And then I can say, hey, is there a pattern for what I've done in the green step? The green step tells me what the context is, and now I would know whether it's appropriate to apply a pattern there. So it controls that use of patterns. This is Kent's book originally, and this is one of the things that always surprised me when I went back to look at Kent's book. Kent was talking about refactoring, Kent was talking about patterns, even when this stuff was not such common knowledge, and he was saying, hey, look, when I'm doing refactoring, these are patterns which I might see, see emerging that I want to deal with, right? One of the key things that's a challenge for people at this step is I don't write new tests when refactoring. I already have the requirement. There's a test that expresses that requirement. I do not need to write a new test. If I decide that these 40 lines of code that I've written be better expressed by two cooperating classes. Those classes are private to my module and are an implementation detail and they don't need a test. And that's challenging for some people because particularly if they come from a unit testing, every unit has to have a test, every method must have a test model. It seems like, but I've got these things that aren't under test. They're not, they are under test. The test that's driving them is expressing the requirement at the level of the API. 
the fact that you've chosen to use two classes to, to, to basically clean up the code in there is nothing to do with the requirement. That's an implementation choice you have made. Another developer may come along tomorrow and decide that those two classes are over complexity and turn it back into a transaction script. Another one may come along two days after that and say, you know what, it's one cooperating class and you keep thrashing until we kind of agree what it is, right? But at no stage in that do we need to write another test. They're just implementation details that we pull out. One of the workshop, I kind of show both approaches and I show you, you know, designing it and effectively being able to reach exactly the same solution without, without the additional tests. Right? So this is where you can use your design skills, but you don't need additional tests. The test you need is the one that confirms the requirements still, is still valid. All right, so you're not choosing your public classes, whoops. Um, you may reach the point where you say, hey, hang on a minute, this thing that I'm doing here, my implementation, that genuinely is another requirement, right? I've seen the other requirement, and you may at that stage want to say, right, that is a collaborator. Now you can still probably need that collaborator up, but you may want to have tests around that collaborator. And sometimes you can find collaborators later on, you're going to pull this functionality out to expose it for other people, in which case you can just tend to do test after to basically create the relevant tests basically around that acceptance criteria. And they'll look very much like your developer test suite from TDD, but essentially you built it the other way around because you're essentially exposing something you already had. And that happens, right? And that's okay. Let's talk about clean architecture. Clean architecture, I, I've got a, a, a fuller talker out there you can find on the internet. But what I wanted to really just look at um, is why it's helpful to us. So clean architecture is a composite written by Bob Martin that kind of composes across a number of existing ideas, hexagonal, boundaries, controllers, entities. They're all variations of the same thing. That's essentially Bob's um, perspective, which is pretty true. And so in the model, you tend to have in the center, you have entities. What's an entity? An entity is a class that has state and behavior, right? And the behavior is, is, is the behavior that requires the state to work. Outside that, in our domain model, we tend to have use cases, and they're essentially the things that are driving those entities to work, right? So in DVD terms, they're more akin to a domain service, right? And uh, essentially they're often expressed in software as, hey, this is the thing that drives the entities to cooperate together to make something happen for the individual customer, which we can think of as the requirement from our use case or our user story. So the place I would expect acceptance criteria to be expressed are in that use case ring. Outside that, we get a ring, which tends to be the software that is essentially hosting our code. So we've written in a web framework, which has some control we need to implement in order to get the HTTP stuff in our parameters and call our underlying code, or it's something that essentially allows us to talk out to a database or to a payment provider. And that ring is effectively, hey, we're talking to, we're either being hosted in a framework and here's our entry point, or essentially we need to call out to some code that we, uh, a framework we're using like an ORM and here's our entry point. And they wrap that outer ring, they wrap things like, oh, I'm talking HTTP over the wire, oh, I'm talking to a database, oh, I'm talking to a message queue, right? So we tend to implement what's in pink and yellow, we tend to get off the shelf, what's in green from an open source project, and the stuff on the outside tends to be infrastructure we bought and the, basically the platform team is running for us. Okay. The the other thing to know about this is we depend inwards. The key idea on these models is that dependencies go inwards. What we mean by that? We mean that something in the use case layer can basically use an entity, but an entity can't use something in the use case layer. Our controllers can call our use cases, which can call our entities, but our controllers, our entities can't talk to our controllers. And our controllers have to go through a use case to talk to an entity, right? Our entities can't talk to our gateways, they go out through a use case like layer to the gateway to the database. And that's why potentially ports is a better word here than use case, which is out of the Coburn's term, because you've got outgoing as well as you can go. Um, yeah, there's some, there's some subtlety around that. Watch my talk on clean architecture and get some of the subtlety on that. Uh, do you want to the point? But the idea here, the way this is, this is significant here is that generally what I'm testing is those use cases, those acceptance criteria. So that's where my tests are. And I can think of my tests much like my control, my web controller, et cetera, as the way that I exercise my domain model. 
Our tests are just another thing exercising my domain model. This is a typical model, right? So this is how we map a clean architecture. I've got some notion of an X unit framework. That's my outer blue layer, right? The thing that essentially is outside. And I have a test. The test is kind of driving my code. The test is this kind of boundary layer that interacts between the outside world and my code. And it calls an interactor, which essentially is whatever is my top level API that my test is talking to in the module which may basically uh, interact with a series of entities, i.e. classes that belong to the requirement and help me meet that. Okay. And generally speaking, we have a request model and a response model. In other words, we're saying the entity, you can't basically respond directly with an entity. You should, response value ought to be something that's like a, that's interpretable by out the outside world, JSON or a string or that kind of thing from interacting. And a request model says something comes in and that's what effectively I use to drive that. And it's not an entity either. So DTOs live at this layer if you want them. And down here, you can also see that our interactor talks to the entity gateway. So this is the interactor that tends to be talking to um, uh, outgoing uh, ports like databases as well, et cetera. And those are points where we might want to use a test double when we're calling out. But the interactor and the entities we just exercise directly. And because effectively the entity gateway only exists at this layer, not much of my code is now dependent really on any kind of test double. And I could use an in-memory database and probably solve the problem at the composition route and never really even had to have something that looks like an actual mock or a fake. Um, ignore that bit of a bit, it's complexity. Um, I don't tend to write tests in test-driven development against that adapter layer, as we said. You may wish to, wish to automate it, but don't bother writing test-driven development against it. They're at the same level as your test is. Um, you may need to write some system tests on the outside, and again, you may want to automate them, but they're not part of your test-driven development practice. All right, almost at the close. Principles. So Kent wrote a set of principles about tests, which I think are worth sharing with you. Um, this, by the way, all of my slides live on my GitHub blog and Ian Cooper. Um, if that's not convenient for you guys, I'll figure out with the organizers how to share them with you. Um, uh, and they've got links to on various slides to where some of the sources are. Um, and I'll sort that out with the organizers afterwards. All right. Um, he basically said they should respond to behavior changes. So what we mean by that is uh, they're based on the requirements that we have, not respond to structure changes. In other words, we, the test itself shouldn't understand how we are implementing the requirement and changes to those implementation details shouldn't affect the test. It should be fast, right? It's a fast feedback process. If my tests take too long to run, I won't run them. It should not be fragile, right? So anything that effectively makes my test fragile, such as basically I'm interacting with the database, multiple tests do that. I may want to replace with a test double, I want to remove that fragility. Should be cheap to write, okay? Things like ATTD fail because they're not cheap to write for what we get back. A simple X unit framework talking to our um, proposed API without any mocking is much cheaper. It should be easy to read, right? I should be able to read them and see the expression of the requirements that came from the customer. What we've done is broken that up into acceptance, unit, integration, and made it very hard for ourselves. We don't need any of that separation, right? If we remove that separation, we just start with working the criteria against our developer tests. And that should be easy to change, right? And that goes to that whole, there shouldn't be coupled implementation details. All right, I'm gonna turn the slide deck off, switch cameras so I can have a sit, and uh, we can take some questions. Okay, thanks a lot, Yan. Um, I learned a lot, a lot of things. For now, we don't have any question. Uh, before before we start questions, I would just uh, like to thank uh, Masoud Bahrami, uh, who uh, organized uh, this event, uh, prepared things. And uh, I want also to thank our sponsor, Soat, uh, that uh, enabled us to recording this video and uh, and other stuff. Um, 
as we don't have questions, uh, I will ask uh, one of mine. Uh, do you have, um, you, you talked about uh, two uh, wonderful books, uh, TDD by example and uh, Test Driven Development. Uh, you, you talked also about, uh, you, talk, uh, you talked also about um, some uh, important people like, uh, like Martin Fowler and Kent Peck. Do you have any other resources, books, katas for people who are interested in TDD and uh, most of all uh, outside in design? Yeah, I mean, I, um, so I'll, I'll shove it in the chat and you find a link to it. So 90 Bottles is a, is a great book about what happens in the refactoring step. Um, and uh, it certainly really helped me um, realize when I was over designing, particularly in refactoring. Um, so let me just share that with you in the chat window. Whoops, I shared it with the organizer. Let me remember to share it to everybody. Um, and that's really worth reading. There's versions down in JavaScript and Ruby, and you can have 99 bottles of milk if 99 bottles of beer um, uh, is not your, your preference. Uh, the, um, there's a problem that happens um, to you when, and it's worth doing the exercise, right? Uh, you, the first thing they ask you to do is implement the, I don't know whether it's uh, cross-cultural, but there's a children's kind of rhyme, 99 bottles are on the wall, one of the bottles falls, they've got 98 bottles, and you just keep going down to the end, right? Six-year-olds, like my daughter, love that kind of thing. Um, and they get you to implement it. Uh, and there are, there are a few things thrown in. For example, you know, you have to go to the store and buy some more when you have none. Uh, and what it teaches you if, you, if you do it blind, and then look at what they're talking about in their solution, is many of us tend to overcomplicate our solution. We tend to get into that refactoring step, and we go, oh, I've only 20 classes. and um, and that's very useful for trying to pull time on over design. And it also has a lot about the idea that we are building an interface um, that should be understandable from the tests, et cetera. And so it's a great book uh, for doing that. Um, I've got on my GitHub, but you can find the rules to it anywhere, Game of Life. And I did use it in my workshop. And what you could practice is what I do a demo of in my workshop, which is essentially try writing um, uh, game of life. Uh, for those you don't know, it's what's called a zero player game, a cellular automation. So actually you have a grid, you place the initial seed of a number of random uh, uh, live cells. And then there are rules that say whether a cell uh, after an iteration lives or dies. So if I have two or three neighbors, I live. If I was dead and I have three neighbors, I come back to life, otherwise I die. Uh, and you can all, you can basically like do a TDD exercise to build that. And I, what I do in the, in the workshop is I say, okay, do that with basically doing unit, the unit testing strategy. So you're, you need to write classes. Every class must be isolated from each other class. Um, and your prompt for writing a new test is I've got a new method or a new edge case condition for a method. Build something like that. Then go away and build it using the style I've, I've been talking about saying, Start with a requirement, try and build something that looks like the requirement and API for, for Conway's Game of Life, right? And um, it, it hopefully will be revealing to you uh, quite how significant the difference is in those two strategies and quite how much less code you need to write. Uh, when I sat on my workshop, it took me three quarters of a day to build a version that was done in the unit testing style and about an hour and a half to do the version in the test driven development style. It is, it is, it makes a significant difference. And by the way, just to mention to everybody on the call, um, so my, my, my Twitter handle is iCooper, I'll type that in. My DMs are open. Uh, I know sometimes, you know, people like to mull over things that people have said in talks uh, and um, think about things and then phrase a question. I also know sometimes it's easier if English is not your first language to write your question down and get a written response from me. So please do reach out. I'm really happy to answer questions if I can. Um, uh, and if that's an easier way for you to do that, I'm really, really happy to try and respond. 
But if you don't hear me for a day or so, I just start, I got I got really busy, but I will try and get to everybody eventually. Um, and sometimes you can with it because TweetKit doesn't show me uh, a request for new access occasionally on time. And after I've, and I've got my phone and it prompts me that someone's trying to message me. But yeah, just reach out honestly. Okay, thanks a lot, Yan. Uh, it appears that we don't have uh, any question. Uh, so thanks everybody joining us, uh, re reaching our webinar. Thanks again, Yan, uh, hey, no giving worries. us uh, your time.